Good evening, happy holiday weekend, and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz has the evening off. On the show tonight, a new study from UIC highlights the dramatic racial and political divisions over how Americans think of their national identity. Where do I find my Latino brothers? A new American Legion post with a distinctly Latino identity. <laughs> Revisiting writer James Baldwin's words as the nation once again grapples with its racial conscience. Plastic Free Delight's a personal challenge that's part of a global effort. And an international campaign is asking participants to choose to refuse single-use plastic this July. We share easy tips to go plastic free. First off tonight, it's no secret that America has been divided across partisan and racial lines. But a new nationwide survey of white and black Americans illustrates just how deep some of those divisions are, how differently some people think of what it means to be a good American, and how people see the role of guns and violence in political life. Joining us now are the study's co-author, Isaac Pollard, a UIC graduate student, and Alexandra Philendra, Associate Professor of Political Science at UIC and the study's lead author. Welcome both of you to Chicago Tonight and thanks for joining us. Um, Alexandra, let's start with you, please. The study looked at what people value uh, when they think of being an American. There was uh, agreement on voting rights, respect for institutions, free speech, and resolving political conflict pe peacefully, but there was disagreement on the importance of being born in the U.S., being Christian, and owning firearms. How deep are the divides that you found uh, when it comes to American identity? Well, the good news is that there is a general broad agreement on key principles such as respect for institutions as being uh, important for what makes for a true American uh, and also peaceful resolution of, uh, of conflict, of political conflict. Um, but we see that um, not uh, that a lot of people actually value both Christian religion and uh, nativity in the United States as part of uh, American identity. That what it makes a true American is being Christian and being born in the United States. And what we see is actually that it is for African Americans more so than whites, uh, where we see the importance of Christianity and of nativity. And but what really uh, differentiates people and where people div are divided is on uh, across partisan lines. What we see is that even though there are racial differences, the deeper cleavages here are between uh, Democrats and Republicans in how they how important they think nativity, Christianity, and guns are uh, as part of uh, American identity. And, and let's get into those guns a little bit. Isaac, uh, there's also disagreement on whether carrying guns at a protest or political violence are ever appropriate. How differently do people view those issues? It's pretty, it's pretty stark. Um, if you find yourself to be a Democrat, you are much more likely to not support firearms or protests, not be likely to bring firearms to protest and things like that. And the total opposite is true. Um, you, you know, you check out the full report, just looking at it visually, it's very dramatic. So you strong, people strongly like this. Uh, if they're Republicans, they strongly dislike it. If they're Democrats, um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's kind of staggering to look at. Alexandra, do these divides potentially, do they pose a threat to the stability of the U.S. political system? It is uh, a problem that we should definitely take seriously um, because uh, we live in a time where the Supreme Court and a lot of states have recognized as a right um, the ability of people to carry arms. And many states actually have uh, enabled people to carry arms in public spaces, uh, including uh, protests. There is no uh, essential limitations and in, in uh, of carrying firearms in a protest space. So we are in a situation where our political rights to assemble and express opinion and petition government are colliding with our rights to carry firearms. And in a charged environment where people disagree, it is essential that people feel safe to disagree. 
Uh, and what we see from the survey too is that, um, and from previous surveys that we have conducted, that people are less likely to participate in protests if they think that counter protesters are going to be armed. So I've, there is an issue of um, pulling back and not participating. Isaac, you also found that people saw things very differently um, when it comes to talking about events like the attempted Capitol insurrection or demonstrations after George Floyd's death. Uh, is it almost as though people are speaking two different languages, uh, you know, protest versus riot, for example? It really is, and it makes any sort of effort to encourage, you know, bipartisan conversation challenging when immediately when you start the conversation off, it's framed in a way that you find either strongly negative or strongly positive. Uh, you know, we know from political science that we're rationalizing people and we feel things first and then we make sense of it later. So if you start with, you know, if you find yourself to believe that what happened last summer um, to George Floyd was unthinkable and that you were a part of the protest, if someone starts a sentence off with you saying that the riots last summer were tough, you're already turned off right there. So when thinking about how to bring people together, you got to keep these kind of things in mind because they're very, uh, people feel very strongly about just how events are described, let alone what happened there. And it can make communication difficult. Alexandra, people uh, tend to say that they reject political violence, but your research uh, found that that starts to falter when you get into very specific questions. That is correct, uh, because when you have people saying that um, they're willing to participate in uh, uh, violent demonstrations that are meant to protect their group rights, whatever they understand as, as their groups, or when they say that it is appropriate um, to, have, to use armed violence uh, in support of people's rights, uh, and also a, a significant number of people uh, believe that the government in itself is a threat uh, to our rights in a way that we people need uh, guns to protect themselves from government. So we are creating a very oppositional relationship and incredible levels of mistrust towards our elected officials, the people that we by choice um, put in a place to make decisions for us. And that is uh, a very uh, dangerous position to be in when substantial uh, minorities, but substantial numbers of people in society view our democratic institutions as a problem that requires violence to be contained. Okay, um, we'll have to leave it there. Interesting research you've done. Thank you so much uh, for joining us to you both, Isaac Pollard and Alexandra Falindra. Thank you. Yes. The American Legion was chartered in 1919 as a veterans organization serving those who fought in World War I. Over the years, the organization expanded to include all who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces. But even as the American military has become more racially diverse, the makeup of most American Legion posts has given it a persistent image as a place for older, mostly white male veterans. Now, a Chicago man has decided it's time to change that by making a new place for Latino veterans to find community. Chicago Tonight's Erica Gunderson has the story. When I joined the United States Army in uh, 2007, when I arrived for basic in Forsyth, Oklahoma, uh, which we arrived at the airport, so it's at Oklahoma City, you had Legionnaires there. And they, right away they like gave us snacks and they fed us. And they're like, here, sign this paper, sign this paper. You're in the American Legion now, you're good to go. The century old veterans organization, the American Legion, counts all who served active duty in any of the branches of the American Armed Forces as members. But even though they were members, for young Latino veterans like Marcos Torres and Daniel Del Rivero, it didn't seem like a place for veterans like them. I just knew they were kind of a veteran social club who wore, you know, specific uni cats. And I thought they were just an older generation of veterans. Once his time in service was done, Torres had forgotten all about his brief encounter with the American Legion. But he still sought out the company of veterans in his community. After hosting his own Veterans Day events for a few years, Torres visited American Legion Tattler Post 973, and inspiration struck. I fell in love. I fell in love with it. I mean, everybody was amazing. And so I started asking questions like, hey, 
Where do I find my Latino brothers? Where do I find my African-American brothers? Where are they at? Why don't they have a post? And so I decided, I said, you know what, we need to start an American Legion post that represents those soldiers in that community. So that way we make sure that they're getting taken care of and they're being spoken for. Tattler Post Commander Brent Webb helped Torres get a rare new American Legion post chartered. In 2019, Sergeant Jason Vasquez Post 939 became official. I think that what Post 939 is doing is something that's really remarkable. Marcos and the team that he's built has done something that um, is going to bring together a part of the veteran community that has felt disconnected. And I, I'm here to support that 100% because I couldn't think of something that's more American, that's more patriotic than wanting to bring together the individuals that want to do good for our neighbors. Torres and his team are building a post with a distinctly and intentionally Latino identity. Its name honors a 24-year-old National Guardsman who was killed in Afghanistan in 2008. Torres led the honor guard that laid Jason Vasquez to rest. So Jason Vasquez, um, also known, you know, we knew him as, as uh, J-Rock, Mr. Logan Square. We shared a, a ton of similarities. And so I knew that easily his story could be mine. What a wonderful thing that Jason would have a name of, or be part of a legion that uh, it would be in our community. And it would be like, hey, we're Latinos too. We wear uniforms just like, you know, any, any other uh, career and somewhere to, to celebrate and, and, and come together. We're just grateful and honor. Yeah, it means a lot, you know. Even the post's number is Latino. 939 is one of the area codes for um, Puerto Rico. And it's just kind of our, our little trademark, our watermark that'll continue long before or long after we leave. Post 939 has a distinct mission too, supporting Latino veterans' mental health by offering community and representation. There's a big phrase in the military, it's called suffer in silence. When I was in, in the job I did, if you asked for any sort of mental help, they, you were essentially ineffective. You weren't doing your job, you weren't helping your buddies out. And that's something that's kind of, I think, going along with the culture of veterans. I think that's something we can change. With regards to the veteran community, we know that they are um, at higher risks for suicide, homelessness, um, unemployment and underemployment. And so it's our job, our responsibility as um, an American Legion post to attack systematically um, these issues one by one um, for all veterans, um, but particularly we would like to address the Latino population as well. As a Latino veteran, uh, our needs are different. Our, our environment is different. Our music is different. Our food is different. Uh, we're always known as the, the culture that always wants to dance and have a good time. But at the same time, we want to share the experiences we have as veterans, share our history, uh, the Borinquenaires, the, the, the Puerto Ricans that served in, in Vietnam. If you do go to a post, you don't see pictures of Roy Benavides. He was a Medal of Honor recipient. You don't see anything that explains or that talks about the 10,000 Mexican-Americans who fought in the Union Army fighting against slavery. Because when we come back from deployments or when we come back from our service, it's important to keep on seeing those things so that we can thrive. The leaders of Jason Vasquez Post 939 are scouting locations for a home base in Logan Square or Humboldt Park. But until they find that place, they're meeting here at the Tattler Post in Lincoln Square. And they're recruiting. It's a welcoming space where they can come, they can laugh, they can joke, they can still feel that camaraderie. It's really healing to a lot of veterans. Post 939 is on the march and we are looking for people that, that want to be a part of this mission as with, with us as well. For Chicago Tonight, this is Erica Gunderson. Jason Vasquez Post 939 meets every Thursday at the Tattler Post, as Erica said. You can find details on our website. Up next, revisiting writer James Baldwin's words in a conversation that aired earlier this year in our Sunday program, Black Voices. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. For many people, the events of the last four years have felt like the result of a failure by the U.S. to act upon the lessons of its past. 
During the civil rights era, writer James Baldwin bore witness to America's second great racial reckoning in his work. The 2020 book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own, revisits Baldwin's words as the nation once again grapples with its racial conscience. Joining us now is the author, Dr. Eddie Glaw, Jr. He's also a Princeton University professor and contributor for MSNBC. Welcome to Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, Dr. Glaude. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to so have much. you. Absolutely. So when this book was released, it was actually last summer, June 2020. We were, the nation was in the throes of a racial uprising. Now we are a month into uh, a new presidential administration and six weeks removed from that insurrection on January 6th. Are we, is the country, uh, as you and as James Baldwin say, are we beginning again? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure at all. I mean, in some ways we have to read what happened on January 6th as an extension of that racial reckoning. You know, the racial reckoning isn't just about police killing us. It's also about the ways in which whiteness continues to animate the distribution of advantage and disadvantage in this country. And January 6th was really about a, a mostly white mob uh, sacking the Capitol in the name of white grievance and white resentment and white hatreds. And I hope that we don't trade one fantasy for another, the fantasy of Trumpism for the fantasy of, you know, the Biden-Harris administration affirming America's inherent goodness and putting the republic back to sleep. We still have a lot of work to do. Why do you think Baldwin's writing has undergone this resurgence that we've seen recently? I think he's the most prescient writer about American democracy and race that we've ever produced. And in so many ways, he was ahead of his time, right? He's kind of misfitted, kind of forcing us to think about the problem from different angles. And we're in this moment where it seems as if uh, what he spied on the horizon in, the, in those early days have come to fruition. And so folks are reaching for him because I think he offers the most insightful, um, insightful commentary on, on the contradiction at the heart of American democracy, right? He, he kept track of the serpent that always threatened to swallow whole our experiment, as it were. Now, here at WTTW, we have a little bit of our own uh, James Baldwin archive. Here is a clip from an interview that he did with our own John Calloway back in 1985. Speaking as a writer again, sometimes you're writing a page or a sentence, and you have to change a word in the sentence. And when you change that word, you move that word out or put another word in, you change the entire page. You change the entire page. Now, one could consider that what we as Americans are going through as we approach the end of the 20th century, it might be useful to change a single word. We talk about the black problem. It might be interesting to see what would happen to the page if one decided to discuss the white problem. Now, Dr. Glaude, you argue that the country is founded on a lie and that that lie uh, is that the black man is not a man. Thus, the country then forgives itself for the treatment that it inflicts on uh, black people for so many years. Um, and as Baldwin just said, that, you know, that we frame this as a black problem versus being a white problem. Then the question is, how do you convince someone uh, of the truth when, as you say, what they've been seeing is a lie for so long? Well, I mean, in some ways, um, the fact that the country is broken occasions a possibility for us to, to kind of confront the ugliness of, of who we are and, and, and what we've done. At the heart of Baldwin's corpus is this radical inversion that the problem isn't us, it never, it never has been. And so when we begin to understand uh, uh, that it hasn't been us, that, you know, it's Baldwin who would say, I'm not the N-word. The question is, why did you need the N-word in the first place? And that, that inversion shifts, shifts the burden of analysis. In a moment of crisis, we have an opportunity. Now, it doesn't guarantee that, that people will listen. It doesn't guarantee that people will, be, will find the move compelling. But it certainly orients those of us who are trying to build the New Jerusalem differently, you see. It will orient us differently as we try to build solidarities to give, you know, to, to, to help bring a new America into being as we shift, oh, I love that formulation, as we change the word, you know? That, uh, that's wonderfully put. Of course it is. <laughs> oh, and, and uh, you know, 
in your talking about this book, I know that you refer to James Baldwin. The rest of us call him James Baldwin because he's James Baldwin. You call him Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you call yeah. him Jimmy? You know, I've been walking with Baldwin for, you know, Jimmy for 30, 30 years. And it's an intimate kind of relationship for me, um, teaching me how to be, how to manage my rage, how to confront my own vulnerabilities, um, urging me as I was trying to write this book uh, to, to, to not imitate him, but to, to trust my own voice, uh, to understand what it means to be a witness. So I re affectionately call him Jimmy because there's this intimacy that I have with his body of work. Um, um, and, and so it is, it is, it's an announcement in some ways brandness of what he means to me. Absolutely. So you've cautioned against teaching black history uh, in a manner that sanitizes historic figures like Martin Luther King into this, you know, sort of safe heroic reduction um, of who he was versus what the fight was actually like for him. Do you think this allows people to sanitize uh, the history of racist and racism in a, in a similar way? Sure. Dr. King is, you know, his bones have been picked clean. And oftentimes he's invoked in our politics as a kind of rear guard action to contain radical imagination, to, to, to arrest uh, demands for substantive change. Think about how Dr. King's voice is used in the context of our debates around policing in this moment. So absolutely, there is a sense in which in our moment there, there has been an effort to narrow the range of what constitutes legitimate forms of black politics. And Dr. King is often invoked as the principal uh, representative of what is legitimate forms. And, and what's so ironic about it and insidious actually, is that it is, a, it is a caricature of Dr. King's life, of his witness. It's almost as if we keep, we, we freeze him in 1963 and then we murder him over and over again every holiday by locking him into 1963, you see. So absolutely, absolutely. In the few seconds we've got left, uh, Dr. Glaude, what would Baldwin say about the state of, uh, of racial equality today? I wouldn't dare try to anticipate Brother Jimmy's words, but I know what I've learned from him. And what he would say is that what we have to do is tell the truth about where we are, and where we are is where we've always been, and that is that America needs to grow up, finally, and face its ghosts. Okay. Our thanks to Dr. Eddie Glaude. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, I appreciate you. Again, the book is called Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. And you can read an excerpt on our website. Back with more Chicago Tonight, right after this. Efforts to minimize plastic pollution took a hit this year as the coronavirus pandemic prompted a surge in single-use plastics. But this month, the Shedd Aquarium is part of a global effort that hopes to change that. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with more about the Plastic Free July campaign. Patty, welcome back. Happy 4th. What Same is, to you. Thank you. What is the reason behind the Plastic Free July campaign, and what's the easiest way to participate? Yeah, well, if you think about the strides that cities like Chicago had been making with things like the plastic bag tax, you know, the pandemic came along and between things like PPE, packaging and uh, disposable foodware, there are some estimates that the use or consumption of single use plastics jumped like 250 to 300 percent because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so this, you know, um, Plastic Free July is a way to kind of get things back on track and to get people thinking again about reducing their use of plastics, which boils down a lot to reuse. So think about plastic bags, think about water bottles, think about straws, and try and find a reusable alternative to those. That's a big jump. Uh, real quick before yes. we let you go, uh, the Shed Aquarium is supporting the campaign. What kind of initiatives is the aquarium doing? 
Well, they've always been on the leading edge of reducing plastics because the amount of plastics that wind up in the ocean and threaten uh, aquatic wildlife. So they have a weekly series of webinars coming up in July. Um, and they're also building an activist community through their Surge platform, which you can find out more about on the Shed's website. Um, and they will have a lot more information about things people can do to advocate for um, a plastic-free society and, and keeping more plastics out of our waterways. Okay, Patty Wetley, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. Happy 4th. Same to you. And you can find more about Plastic Free July on our website. That's wttw.com news. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join Paris Shuts and me tomorrow night live at 7. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for joining us this holiday weekend. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm named on the 2021 Expertise List of the best personal injury attorneys in Chicago.